decades ago, I found myself citing Professor Berman a great deal. Uh, here at the University of Chicago, we got to invite a guest once for a prestigious seminar, and we chose John Witte because we liked exactly what he was doing. Uh, I've been there for a couple of addresses, and uh, that's before there was a center, but you could see that the energy was building up, that this was a place where this could happen. It had the encouragement of faculty and background. So when it was announced, I think we historians like things neat, and I think it came with a new century, 2000. And so uh, when that came, uh, I guess I was ready to go. I've had a lifelong interest in children and a child. And uh, one day, John Witte and Don Browning sat me down and said, uh, we have a new project and we'd like you to take part in it. And if you took part in it, what your accent would be. And I instantly blurted out, because I always cared about it, I'd like to work on the mystery of the child. Children are a big part of my own personal life. We had four sons. Uh, we uh, had two foster children whom we adopted. I have a stepdaughter and uh, three great-grandchildren, nine grandchildren. Uh, this is a big part of our life. One year we had seven boys age 9 to 14 at the table for a whole year. And it's just buzzing, buzzing, buzzing. And uh, we worked out a lot of covenants, how we would interact with that, and it always impressed me how much imagination they bring and how hard we work to kill it off, how much wonder is a part of their life and how we try to push them into a certain groove. Uh, this is a book against super control. It's against the notion that because we're older and bigger, we can determine everything about their life. And uh, they fight back with their only instrument, which is to have a tantrum. And you can never negotiate during a tantrum. We always tell our kids, you know, get over it. When you're over your snit, come back in and we'll have fun, which we would do. Most of these child care manuals assume that the, you have to have control, whether the teacher or the parent. I don't mean malicious control, I don't mean the whip, but I mean that you have to have it figured out. And I think the more you think about children, the more you find that they won't ever have it thought out. So that this, uh, the concept of mystery, which runs through the book, goes back to a, a French philosopher, Gabriel Marcel, who says, problems have solutions. You may not always reach them. Uh, you could move the biggest building in Chicago, the Sears Tower, if you had enough money. The problem is getting enough money and big enough cranes, but you could do it. But you can't control the imagination of a child without killing off what's wonderful about a child. I have to say, it could not have happened had I not been in that project. Uh, I could not have written it by punching Google, or going to the library, or having a research assistant, or just reading, reading, reading. It's really born of that weekly dialogue, I think 19 of them. <laughs> um, when you walk into an interdisciplinary situation, you are either in a place where no one has any concept of it, and they stumble around, or at a place where there's been an encouragement of it, where the leaders know. John Witte and the team and so on have done that on other projects, so they're ready to go and they know how to play that interplay of specialty and general. Uh, and uh, therefore, we had a lot going for us. As far as I'm concerned, uh, I have a double vision of interdisciplinarity. First of all, it's interdisciplinarity. That is, it has to be disciplined. It's not mush. It's not everybody skimming the surface. So it's very important that everybody in the room was really good at something. Students are fortunate when there's something interdisciplinary going on, if they respect the disciplines, because that's when scholars make themselves vulnerable to each other. Well, it's a project on the child, and the temptation is to assume that everybody who cares about the child is somebody in mid-career of education, or uh, psychology, or counseling, or something like that. And I think to have somebody around who's not known for this, but who picks up what you do 
by studying history for a long time was probably an asset. Because if you're a historian, you are surprised when anything good happens. You are not put down when things go bad because you've seen it. First of all, everybody you write about dies, so you can't have utopianism or mere optimism. Uh, you're born a realist uh, and you've seen terrible things happen. Thirty years war, third of Europe is killed. Uh, Black Death, half of Europe dies, and the next generation, they have new children, they're coming up, and these kids write, uh, dance, and they have poetry, and so on. And I think the historian brings a little of that sense. You're not going to be done in. And I would often uh, raise it that way with the group, again, because they had to work on a problem. It's pretty easy to go down. And I would often say, you could do all that, but you also have to account for where do all the good kids come from, because there are a lot of good kids. The programs I was at in the large auditorium in the law school, uh, they're not just law students and divinity students, it's, it's the town if they can get in when former President Carter's there, uh, just jammed. And uh, this wouldn't happen if there weren't a center. And now the larger world, um, I have tremendous interest and at the uh, October 24th, 26th event, wrapping up these years, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, the future of uh, law as religion, the future of religion as law. These are two zones of life that are tentacular and interweb. They're just locked together. You don't make a move in America in religion without being aware that separation of church and state means this or doesn't mean that. Uh, a church or a synagogue can't change the parking lot without going to the zoning board. Um, you better be watching the laws about child abuse, sexual abuse. You better be sure that what's tax exempt is rightly tax exempt. Meanwhile, the legal profession around the world is finding, think of all the things you can't do in the Islamic world because uh, of the law. Well, Emory has somebody there who knows that, and that helps. There are plenty of places in the U.S. where there are good individual scholars of this field, though this center always draws on them and brings them in. But there's no place where you have that convergence and concentration of energies, and that's what's always excited me about it. While the Emory Law School has always done a good deal on the international, uh, wonderful two volumes on human rights, for example, it's unmatched. So you can't say you had to have the center to do that, but with the center there now, I do think that we just can't think about any of these questions without immediately doing things globally. I think all 19 of ours were domestic. They were chosen on those grounds. You can't do everything at once. but. Uh, when we have President Carter there in these public programs, he quickly reminds us, and he and Dr. Fagy, who was another one of our guests, um, marshal a team to get rid of river blindness or um, working on guinea worm, horrible stuff. Uh, even those parabolic references let us know there's another world out there. Now, we can address individual problems, HIV, AIDS, and so on, but I think to have a sustained, interrelated thing, uh, I'd like to see it uh, do more on going global. And it has access to it. We have a talent. Uh, we have uh, people from other nations, if immigration allows them in, uh, or allows them to stay when they are here, or helps them carry it back, which is more important, to the places they came from. I would think that would be one of the major emphases I'd work on in the future. What I really had fun with was chatting with them all after the day that President Carter was on, the first time. And he was telling his story. All of a sudden, he turned to this room with 400 law students and 200 divinity students and everybody else, and he said, <clears throat> Now, if I know Marty, this project is going to end with 19 books. Who of you are going to change the world? And then he pulled out of his pocket. He said, this afternoon, we need 20 people of the Genesis Project. We need so and so many people. He had a whole list of projects for, with uh, prostitutes, with homeless, with all these things, ready to go. Uh, by the way, a month later, when we had another program, public program, some of them came and said, I never did that in my life, but a foreign president asked us to, so I did, and now I'm hooked. That's how he recruits. But um, when we went back 
the snacks at halftime and after and whenever we talk about it, that question really burned in people's mind. This project in 19 books, how are you going to change the world? Now, if Frank Alexander goes back to Flint, Michigan, where he studies the laws for the homeless, and draws together 10 or 20 people, which he's likely to do, who deal with that elsewhere, uh, they're going to change the world. 